Good afternoon. It's a very challenging time, but I would just like to ask your help so that I will say something that will be useful for all of us. I would like to acknowledge the presence of my two priests, three priests who are here from the Diocese of San Carlos because we are making this experience together. Our pastoral director and rector of the cathedral, Father Edwin Laude, is also here at the back. Our family and life minister and parish priest of Canlaon Parish, who also established a PDO in the parish, so it's a parish-based PDO, Father Alwin Jimenez. And our youth director, the Commission on, Fam on the Youth and Paris Priest in Sagay, Father Erwin Magnanao. Parang mahina ang clap, so para... <laughs> Actually, I purposely did that so that you will <laughs> exercise a bit. Um, it's a sharing, so but then uh, mostly I will draw some important things that I'm learning, some insights from the experience. Actually, it's a very, we're just at the beginning, so it's nothing solid, I would say, but it's still a work in progress. But I hope we can uh, help one another in discovering the hand of God behind all these uh, developments. So it, the topic given to me is a philanthropy-based economy at the UCS and innovation. So uh, this is my outline. Uh, I will start with some basic principles and values that I would consider non-negotiables. These are important uh, uh, pillars or cornerstones in our collective journey as a diocese. And some of these were also touched by Father Greg earlier. And then uh, the, the, the second uh, topic will be the time when I was sent by Pope Francis in uh, San Carlos and then how I came about starting this SPDO, and then the development, and then what it means to belong to an ecosystem, and eventually our ways forward, what we envision to happen. Sharing this with you helps us also uh, find some supporters, no? so that we will, not, we will be encouraged to go ahead. No? So we'll start with some basic principles. Um, the first one is from Matthew 6, uh, 26 to 29. Um, we, all, we all are familiar with this. The example of the birds and the lilies, they do not really sow nor reap, yet the Holy Father feeds them. No? And we are more important than them. We are much worth of value than them. The lilies of the field, they are dressed so beautifully. And yet, even Solomon, in all his glory, are not arrayed with some, something like that. No? So on one hand, we are exhorted to not worry, not be anxious. Because even the all around us, there are many signs of, of a Father in heaven who knows how to take care of us. So, the first foundation for me is really trust in the divine providence. That there is a wealth of experience around us, if we care to notice it, of the providence of God. But sometimes we don't appreciate it. We just take them for granted, starting from the air we breathe. We have one priest who got sick, and he, was, he, he had difficulty breathing. And it was in that moment that he really appreciated how important air is, which we oftentimes take for granted. No? So anyway, the second one is from Matthew 6 still, verse 33. 
Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. We know this as well. That um, the formula, if we can call it that way, although it's not just a formula, the secret is really make sure that we are seeking the kingdom of God first. Then the rest will be given to us. So it's uh, the second cornerstone for me is the choice of God, choosing God as the f- most important in our life. And it will follow that the providence will come. The hundredfold will always be there. In fact, a confer- the confirmation that we are doing God's work is that there will always be the hundredfold. There will always be the providence. As was mentioned earlier, um, if you have to do a, a work of charity, believe it will come. Because it is God's work. So the hundredfold will always be there. But our obligation, our challenge is to see to it, we make sure that we seek first the kingdom of God. And if the hundredfold is not coming, maybe it's a, time, it's a moment to examine ourselves, our life. Maybe we are not really putting God at the center of our life. Maybe God is not there, present. I mean, not that he doesn't want, but we reject God or we refuse to really put him in the number one. The third is my favorite ever since as a young person, Romans 8, 28. No, everything works for good for those who love the Lord. Or as is it put here, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. So it means when we choose God, it means doing concretely his will, not our will, but God's will. So we distinguish in the light of the gospel yesterday about Martha and Mary between working for God or doing God's work. Because we might be assuming that we are doing this for God. But it is exactly what God does not want us to do. We are just projecting it. So it's important to really find out what, what is most pleasing to God in your particular situation. And in this will of God, there is a clear indicator that this will always be the will of God. The love of God and love of neighbor. That's the most generic you can get. If it is for love of God and neighbor, and it is certainly an expression, genuine expression of God's love and of our neighbor, then that's really the will of God. And that it will, we will be able to realize God's plan and we will be able to accomplish our mission entrusted to us. The fourth is, now on one hand, we are asked to not be anxious, to, to learn from the birds and the, and, the, and the lilies of the field. But at the same time, on the other hand naman, uh, we are also cautioned to make sure that we don't bury our talent that there is also an obligation for us to, to make use of what we receive from God. And God expects us that we will give it back to Him with an increase. He doesn't want us to bury the gifts that we receive. He wants us to double them, to triple them, to multiply them. So here you see a bit of tension. It may seem a tension. On one hand, we are asked to not worry, to trust in the divine providence. But on the other hand, we are also asked to be responsible for what we receive. In the parable of the talents, we are reminded that to, to whoever received more, much is expected. And if we don't have that responsive heart, whatever we have will be taken pa from us. So this is where philanthropy comes in as well. 
and stewardship vis-a-vis indifference and I would say ingratitude. Because when we recognize that we receive so much blessings from the Lord, it would be ingratitude on our part not to do something about them. To simply keep them, hoard them, and keep them to ourselves. It would not be pleasing, it would not be pleasing to God. So, um, this is another challenge for us. From a heart that is grateful, we share our time, talent, and treasure. And so, stewardship would have these components. A recognition that everything that we are and that we have are God's gifts. And so, the, fo- the cornerstone is always gratitude. We cannot be philanthropic and be a good steward if we are not grateful. So it starts with gratitude always. And because of this gratitude, we feel responsible to take care of them, that we cannot afford to abuse them because it's like abusing the giver. Our challenge always and invitation is not just to stop at the gifts, but to constantly Focus on the giver, the source of all these gifts. Sometimes we stop short of the gifts and don't, do not go beyond the source of all these gifts. Like St. Augustine, no? for so many years he was just seeking God and failed to recognize God in God's creation. No? But He was not able to go beyond the beauty of all the created things and recognize the giver. So for us, in the philanthropic uh, uh, work and in stewardship, we start by recognizing the giftedness of everything. It's all grace, and we are grateful, then we are responsible, and therefore we can be generous. We share because out of the abundance of our heart that is grateful, we cannot but share. And because of the gospel as well, we are challenged to give back more than what we receive. So this is in- integral to stewardship, to philanthropy that we always give something more back to God with an increase. Another basis for me why I am so passionate about this is also my own Episcopal motto. I was given this word of life from the first letter of John chapter 2, verse 6. He who says he abides in Christ ought to live as he lived. But when I translated this into Latin, instead of using the past tense, lived, I used the present tense, vivid, as Christ lives even today, right now. So the standard is always, how would Christ do it now, today, as he did it before? So if we are true disciples of the Lord, our standard of acting and deciding is always Christ. And so, I'm so happy that the last apostolic exhortation of the Holy Father, he entitled it, Christus Vivit. Because he wants to remind us that Christ is alive, even today. And our philanthropic work, the PDO, is, should really be a witness, a reminder a constant witness to people that indeed Christ is alive. And uh, the other word of God for me that is that should really inspire us to do something about our work is this challenge of the Lord from, Matthew, from Luke chapter 5 verse 4, set out into the deep and lower your nets for a catch. Duke in Altum. It's for me, 
be allowing ourselves to be challenged to go beyond our comfort zone, the familiar shores. Uh, later on, we will use the term, think outside the box, go beyond the nine dots, you know, paradigm shift, you know, going into the, the deep. You know? So this is the challenge for us. And then, because of all these things, because of all this inspiration, SPDO of the Diocese of San Carlos was born on December 3, 2015, the Feast of St. Francis Xavier. And this is the logo. And there in the logo, you have the word Ubuntu. I am because we are. It is borrowed from an African Salsha tribe that thinks not so much of themselves as an individual, but as always related to the community, to the rest. They don't see themselves apart from the body of Christians, of people. So our vision mission is put it, we put it this way, a strong and joyful solidarity among lay, religious, and clergy for service of all, especially the lost, least, last, and left out ready and able to go anywhere, even to the most difficult to reach, assured of support from everyone, starting from the bishop and his collaborators. So we challenge ourselves that we are there in office, in function of those in the peripheries, of those who are sent out. And because of this, we make as our inspiration, this story about Ubuntu. I think some of you or most of you are familiar with this already. Um, an anthropologist proposed a game to the kids in the African tribe by asking them to run after a basket full of fruits. And when he asked them to run, he was expecting them to outrun each other. But instead, each one hold hands held the hands of the other and ran together towards the fruits and partook of the fruits together. And when he asked them why, he said, one of them said, how can one be happy when the others are sad? So it's a beautiful challenge for us, starting from among us priests, from among us working in the diocese, to not just consider our own personal welfare, but always together with this, think of the good of everybody. So we want to witness to a caring church in the spirit of Ubuntu. Pag inig unay is a Cebuano term which means fraternity. And in our liturgy, instead of saying, let us offer each other the sign of peace, in Cebuano translation, we use ipakita ang pag inig unay which means in every Eucharist, we are reminded to, we are always constantly reminded to give witness to our fraternity, our brotherhood, our solidarity. And the bishop's residence is called Bishop's Home. I'm happy to transfer to a place where everybody calls Bishop's Home. Although all people would like still to refer to it as their Bishop's Palace, Palacio, no, but uh, I'm happy that the popular name is it's a bishop's home that speaks more of a family. And then we use also the, the byword, walang iwanan. We are all in this together. No one should be feeling left out or abandoned. So briefly, let's uh, watch this short clip. Um, which captures so much our imagination as Presbyterium and as people of God in the diocese. These physically handicapped children in the video are symbolic of all of us. Each one of us, literally even one of us, has a crutch now. <laughs> they are on a race and watch what happened.
no sound is coming out. Never mind. As you can see the picture, no? One of the important lessons I learned is that we are as strong as our weakest link. So if we don't care for our weakest link, that's where we will also uh, fail. And so an authentic sign of a community, a true Christian community, is how we treat the most vulnerable members of our community. And so for us, the Philanthropic Development Office, the Stewardship Office, is in service, particularly, although it's for everybody, but particularly for the weakest link among us. And it's so inspiring to see that these children with physical disabilities are also capable of showing care for the most vulnerable among them. They went back for, to someone who fell. Wouldn't it be beautiful if in our local churches there would be concrete expressions like this? But of course, it's a work in progress. No, it's not always easy. It's always a challenge. So the second part is when I first came to the diocese, the diocese is a place of contrast as well. There are many beautiful sides to the, to the diocese, but also very ugly and challenging, difficult sides to it. We were created 31 years ago. So last 1988, we celebrated our Pearl Jubilee, and uh, in the island of Negros, there are four dioceses now. San Carlos is a fruit of the love between the Diocese of Bacolod and the Diocese of Domaguete. They contributed each to uh, our formation as a diocese. So we are part, a fruit of philanthropic act. No, between Bacolod and Domaguete. And mainly it's mountainous and lowland. There are six cities and six municipalities. And uh, we have at the moment 26 parishes. Start, we started with 22. Now we, there are 26, seven quasi-parishes, 11 mission stations, and one chaplaincy with a total of 41 
uh, pastoral occupations. And the population wise, over a million, 81% Catholics. That we have 80, 80 priests after our Bishop Emeritus died this year and another priest died. No? So we are down to 80. 65 are still active. That's 81%. But we have a ratio of one priest to 16,000 faithful. Six of our priests are sick or retired. Actually, two are in and out in the ho the hospital. Uh, one just had a pacemaker placed on him. Another one had an angioplasty. One who is in and out, supposed to have a bypass, but at his age of 89, he could not make it anymore. So there's no need to have an operation anymore. So eight are in mission work, official mission work, because other dioceses would have need of more priests. So my predecessor said, we share our priests not out of surplus, but even in our want. So that's also very philanthropic. No? And one is on graduate studies. So when we divide them according to age in ministry, 30% belong to the senior clergy, like myself. And then 30% or 24 are belong to the middle clergy. That's 11 years in the ministry to 24 years. And 40%, majority of our clergy belong to the young or junior and junior clergy. That's the first, they are in their first 10 years in ministry. These are the three bishops of San Carlos. That's the first one who died last February 10 on our anniversary as a diocese. The second one is now Archbishop of Capiz and yours truly. We are blessed with many seminarians, vocations. We have 14 new seminarians who started their propedeutic year. 42 are in college and 35 are in their theology with a total of 91 seminarians. To date, in spite of the fact that both Negros Occidental and Oriental provinces are in the top five richest provinces since 2015, with Negros Occidental being the highest revenue earner in 2017, yet our poverty incidence is higher than the national average of 21.6% of the population. Concretely, Negros Occidental has 29% poverty incident, and Negros Oriental has even higher, 45%. Almost half of the population are poor. How come? In a land of plenty. To illustrate the agricultural workers in Region 6, to which Negros Occidental belongs, only earn less than $6 a day, while the agricultural workers in Region 7, where Negros Oriental belongs, earn only $6 a day as well. And yet the National Federation of Sugar Workers claims that sugar workers in haciendas of Negros on the average get as low as 80 to 120 pesos a day or 1.5 to 2.3 dollars a day. I can give you more statistics, but our time is limited. So during the last Ad Limina, vis Ad Limina visit to the Holy Father, I gave him this original icon made by a brother, Recollect Brother, and we call this icon Jesus Sa Katubhan, or Jesus of the Sugar Cane Fields. The sugar cane symbolizing the hard work of many of our people relying on sugar cane with the, the, the bolo or the, the instrument that they use to cut sugar cane. And then there are these blood-stained uh, bullets because uh, some of our farmers were also victims of recent killings in the island. <clears throat> so, because of this scenario, we feel there is a need to do something more. 
but we cannot just rely on the usual basis for uh, financing the program. So we started by uh, applying for a grant from Miss Munich for a three-year pastoral program that enabled us to revisit our diocesan shared vision mission and to be able to, to articulate the vision mission using the very words of our people through a participatory approach. So the, actually, in terms of content and spirit, there, was, there, there, there have been no, not much change in the vision mission, but it's only in the language, in the, in the tone, and in the articulation, wherein the language is really taken from what the people used when they answered in the consultation process. Translated into English, because it was done in the dialect, we say we are a listening church of the Diocese of San Carlos that strives to become a loving family, a just and peaceful community, united in our concern for the cries of the poor, the youth, and the Mother Earth, as we journey towards Christ through formation and service according to the Word of God and through our active involvement in our basic Christian communities. Now, um, so together with this, we need to revisit our financial system. And so even as we approach the 2021, when we celebrate the 500 years of uh, the beginning of evangelization in the Philippines, and not really evangelization, but the first baptism and Eucharist in the Philippines, there is a move to even do away with the Aransel system, which is the traditional way of uh, gathering support for the church. And so, we, before I even arrived in San Carlos, there was already a tithing system put in place by my predecessor. Uh, he was the godfather of tithing in the country. He went around the country promoting tithing many years back. And so, I, I was fortunate to have inherited this but it's still a mixture, a mixed uh, system. Uh, we still have tithing, but we still have arancel. No, in some parishes, more are more are more revenues are coming from tithing, but in some parishes, it's more from uh, arancel. And so there is a challenge to find other means to support the many things we would like to do. From, uh, for our people. Um, I would like to cite some concrete experiences what convinced me to do something, not just to rely on the traditional system. Because last, when I was installed in November 18 as the third bishop of San Carlos, November 8 came Yolanda, the strongest typhoon so far to have hit the country. And so we were in, in a place in Bacolod, and we were precisely with the uh, beneficiaries of the Agrarian Reform Program. We were dialoguing with the Secretary of Agriculture, Agriculture Agri um, Agrarian Reform, about land disputes and problems. No? And so it was very symbolic for me that my entry into the diocese was through this experience of the typhoon where everything are like around us are destruction, no? And I take comfort from these lines, not all storms come to disrupt our life, some come to clear our path. It makes us see our priorities clearer, no? So from relief and rehabilitation to social action, meaning developmental and liberational actions in the context of the parable of the Good Samaritan, from asking who is my neighbor, who is a neighbor to me, we should be more asking to whom am I called to be a neighbor. Um, so that is our challenge as well. So even before I was installed bishop, 
there was already um, a plan from our clergy to go to Manila to raise funds for our sick priests because some of our priests are in and out of the hospital and there is not much available funds to pay for their hospitalization. So there is that really gave me the challenge to do something, not to just... Because in the duration of one week stay in Manila, we were able to raise one million, but in a matter of few months, the one million was gone. So it cannot be like that as a system, no? In, then out. In, out. Remember, stewardship should be, you have to give back with an increase. So there has to be something more. And that's where the SPDO comes in, no? Uh, and that, this, this system is not something out of obligation only. We are forced to do it. No, it should be an expression of gratitude and appreciation, especially for the priests who have served the diocese for many years. Imagine our priests, because I believe majority, if not all, are really good ones, no? They have been giving their life the best, the prime of their life in service for the church, for the people of God. And what a tragedy it would be that in their twilight years, they will be so insecure that no one will take care of them. So for, for, for me, it's important as a bishop and also as the, the head of the local church that we rally the people of God to do something also to prepare a brighter, a hopeful, and a joyful uh, retirement life for our priests. And so this is where SPDCO comes in. We decided that 5% that we gather from Arancel and from our tithing, as well as from the SPDO collections, will be set aside for priest care fund. And then another reality is about the mission schools. You know, we have mountainous area. There are people of the IPs, the indigenous people. Children have to walk very far to go to school. And if we believe that education is the great equalizer, we have to give them equal opportunity to improve their life through education. And so the diocese established quite a number of mission stations and parochial schools and mission schools. But we cannot charge much. And so there's a need to really subsidize them. And so what happens, whoever is assigned the mission school, if it is time to, to pay the salary of the teachers, they have to borrow money because they don't have enough funds. And then they are also, there is an interest. No? And so for me, I said, it should not be. There has, we, can, we have to do something about it. So we agreed that 5% again from what we received from Arancel and Tithing will be set aside as a buffer fund for our mission schools. And also SPDO will have to work something on, on that. And you will see later on in the report what, how much was what were gathered in the course of time. So at least we're able to move away from that situation where there's so much debts, you no, know, and to having no debts. There's also the initiative of the Paris Pharmacy or Botica Sa Parroquia, making affordable medicines accessible to all, especially the poor. Because in our survey, in the average poor family, whatever income the family has, has gathered, goes only to food and education. No budget at all for medicine and hospitalization. And so they have, the sickness has to be very serious for them to part with their budget for food and education. And so the, the importance of the pharmacy. Anyway, when we launched it last December 3, 2015, we were able to gather 24,575 from, from among the priests and some few lay people who showed up for the launching. Now, that was already a very affirming sign. And then um, I give you roughly, very briefly, as, 
an idea of how it looks like today after four years. From donations, for the past four years, we were got, able to gather 37,509,105.88. Some are divided into internal local donors, internal abroad donors, external local donors, and external abroad donors. Now you can see the percentage. The, some of the providence came through events. Our clergy basketball team called Ubuntu team, you see in the picture, had participated in several events and had contributed a lot of money, as you will see later on in the report, to the priest care fund, mission schools, etc. Also, the, the, now the dinner for a cause is on, on its third year dinner for a cause and there's also the the basketball with celebrity our team would compete with some chosen celebrity who are willing to play with them for a for a for a cause for a cause also you know so the likes of some artists from uh, the national artists no anyway and then, uh, <clears throat> from, these are examples of events. The Mission, Spring Rain Mission Cup, Zumba for a Cause, UP Singing Ambassador, Starpolin Campaign. This we did not uh, exert much effort. We need to go back to that. Then the, in, the Inter-Clergy National Basketball Tournament, Clergy Festival, Walk for a Cause, Dinner for a Cause. You know? So... Then, uh, while, while, while uh, preparing for the next uh, uh, expenses, we invest some of the money and has earned 12%, 600, as you can see. No? So the 5 million became 6, uh, has earned something. No? So meanwhile, we try to give back something more in return rather than in and out in and out no then um, we received mass intentions from various donors to subsidize the priest and mission stations then um, there are also subsidies from various parishes all of, around the country as you can see there and the priests themselves this is something that moved me personally uh, that during recollections, we, from what we received, we also put in something in a common fund to support brother priests in mission stations, aside from the 5% from the Arancel or Taiting. No? So you, we were able to gather 2 million plus from, uh, from the priests themselves. So fund meter, advocacy meter, you can see there from the advocacies. No? We are always falling short of the target, as you can see, but in, as I said, it's a work in progress. It's, we have still a long way to go, but it's a good start. This uh, graph of the giving level constituency, the, the bar represents the local, inter, uh, local donor internal and lo, uh, donor internal, but uh, how is that? <laughs> Got confused already. So anyway, these are four categories: internal, external, local, abroad. No. Uh, there's the giving level constituency, divided accordingly. How much? So in order to strategize some more. Uh, number of donors per advocacy. It's also plotted. And then the constituency monitoring, to make to be able to see. If the existing ones stop, why they stop? And those we need to challenge ourselves to have new donors each year. No? But you can, as you can see, there is also an increase every year, no? somehow. Then the top 20 ranking of those who give, the expenses, the yearly income and expense, 
So this is a summary of income and expense if you're interested. No? And then the operation taken from what we received. So, uh, sorry, I'm rushing because my time is almost up. SPD operate, okay. Next one is projections in the next decade. Where do we commit to go? Knowing that uh, it's the age, coming age is already the fourth industrial revolution and it's the age of artificial intelligence the internet of things and na na nano uh, we call uh, nanotechnology and all we need to still work on the sustainability of our spdo which would mean uh, taking uh, giving attention to the ongoing formation accompaniment and also the improvement on the remuneration of the two personnel we put full time to take care of this office. Also to look into our sources of funds, not to just be contented already with what we have, but to keep on challenging ourselves because we are focusing on the vision and the mission. Uh, computerization of our accounting system is underway and also our, we need to be more actively present in the World Wide Web, World Wide web and so we have to go digital increasing and stabilizing our sources of funds no so some of our property cannot really be utilized fully because there are no titles yet there are only the deed of donation no so um, some of these are paperworks but there should be more proactive exploration on our part for its maximum utilization uh, also, we need to engage more in social entrepreneurial ventures, like uh, there is one in the making regarding uh, cable, cable and internet enterprise, no? <clears throat> which would enable also the diocese to be digitalized and connected through the internet, including our accounting system and uh, the work in the Paris, Paris documents. No? <clears throat> um, then, uh, last, strengthening our tithing system, the ongoing awareness raising. You know, I just came from Mexico. Um, outside Mexico, the, the scheme of the Christian family movement is for every member to give one dollar a year. Only one dollar a year. But because of the sheer number of membership, it can go a long way already. But in Mexico, there's no such thing as $1 a year. They commit to give only 10 pesos a month, I think. But you know how, how is it explained? Not everybody can go on mission. Not everybody can go on evangelization. But they are so formed that they are passionate about participating in the mission. That's why they give 10 pesos. They set aside 10 pesos a month for that participation in the mission. So it's not tithing, but it's for them a way of being involved in the mission worldwide for the care of families and marriages all over the world. And it goes a long way because of sheer number. So imagine... Philippines has, for example, over a hundred million population. Even if the Catholics are just eight, like when we went to the dicastery of the propagation of faith, the, the cardinal secretary there said, the mission collection of the Philippines was 40 million last year. If our population is 100 million, and even if the Catholics are only 80, 80 million, and if the 80 million, even if 60 million would only give one peso each, the collection should have been 60 million, right? And so, uh, it's a big challenge, no? But it's about formation, increasing awareness. So, since my time is up, um, 
I just would like to wrap up by mentioning a, an, an important point for me, why it's so important to belong to an ecosystem like spring rain, for example. This is captured well by the parable of the growing good corn. I don't know if you heard of this. There was once a farmer who grew award-winning corn each year. He entered his corn in the state fair where it won a blue ribbon. One year, a newspaper reporter interviewed him and learned something interesting about how he grew it. The reporter discovered that the farmer shared his seed corn with his neighbors. How can you afford to share your best seed corn with your neighbors when they are entering corn in competition with yours each year? The reporter asked. Why, sir, said the farmer, didn't you know? The wind picks up pollen from the ripening corn and swirls it from field to field. If my neighbors grow inferior corn, cross-pollination will steadily degrade the quality of my corn. If I am to grow good corn, I must help my neighbors grow good corn as well. He is very much aware of the connectedness of life. His corn cannot improve unless his neighbor's corn also improves. That's why we join the ecosystem. We cannot just be an island to ourselves. We should not be looking at each other as competitors to the funders or the philanthropic foundation. No? In fact, if we pull ourselves together, there's a greater likelihood that we will get the grant because there's more impact uh, because we are able to do execute it together in a larger scale. So it is with our lives. Those who choose to live in peace must help their neighbors to live in peace. Those who choose to live well must help others to live well. For the value of a life is measured by the lives it touches. And those who choose to be happy must help others to find happiness. For the welfare of each is bound up with the welfare of all. The lesson for each of us is this. If we are to grow good corn, we must help our neighbors grow good corn as well. So, it is possible to give away and become richer. It is also possible to hold on too tightly and lose everything. Yes, the liberal or generous man shall be rich. By watering others, he waters himself. So, I think I will just end here because there is no more time. Thank you.